we are involved in here at St. Stephen's and where I currently serve as co-president. But um, I invited Ricky to come and reflect uh, with us on his experience working for the newspaper. Um, Ricky was raised in South Carolina. He studied print jour journalism at Winthrop University. He has five years of reporting experience and he covered uh, the city of North Charleston and the religious community for the Post and Courier. And Ricky is also uh, an AME pastor, uh, which I think was probably an interesting experience for him uh, to cover the religious community. And um, Ricky and I uh, had lots of conversations when he was uh, working for the newspaper on a whole range of different topics and issues. Uh, and so I'll, I'll look forward to hearing his, his thoughts. But before I turn it over to Ricky, why don't we begin uh, just with a word of prayer. Uh, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. And gracious God, we thank you for uh, the gift of this beautiful, beautiful day. Uh, we thank you for the gift of, of one another. Uh, we thank you, uh, God, for Ricky, for the gifts that you have given him. Uh, and, uh, and we ask that you bless our, our time together, uh, our reflections, our conversations, that we may grow more fully into who you call us to be. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, without further ado, Ricky Dennis. Ricky. Oh, you, you shouldn't have. You shouldn't have. Uh, well, I want to thank, uh, where do I stand? You tell me. I, well, I'm going to, I may stay there. I mean, I just need somewhere to put, put this outline. And then I'm short, so the higher I can be, the better it is. Uh, well, I want to thank Reverend Shoemaker for the opportunity to come and share and reflect. And just thank you all for, for coming out. Um, it, I forgot, I think it actually was Reverend Rebecca Hines at the Unitarian uh, Universalist Church. Uh, and she said to me a few weeks ago, she said, you should never take for granted the fact because I never take for granted the fact that every Sunday I have a pulpit where people come to hear me speak. And that was moving for me because sometimes, you know, when I'm preaching, uh, at least in my church, uh, they don't say anything. So I'm wondering if I'm saying anything that, that makes sense. Uh, so anytime I get the chance to, to speak and folks um, are interested in hearing what I have to say, I count it a privilege and I, and I, and I consider it uh, an honor. So thank you, Reverend Shoemaker, and thank you all for um, the chance to come and reflect. Um, this is an intimate setting, so I hope that as I'm talking, you will interrupt uh, and just ask questions and provide insight uh, because I don't want to hear my voice for the next, what, hour? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd rather not. Um, I've heard enough of me earlier this morning. So anytime you can stop me and ask a question or two, I, I'd appreciate it. I was born in Staten Island, New York. My father, who I'm named after, of course, uh, was born in Queens. His mother and father had him while they were still in high school. So they put him on a plane with an older woman who flew him to Liberia, West Africa, where his grandmother was. He was raised in a small town known as Kakata uh, in Liberia, West Africa. Went to school in Paris, came back to Liberia to work for the local government there. And then when the coup d'etat happened, he left and came to New York City, where he met my mother, who was also working for the city of New York. Uh, in uh, social services. They had me in 1992, and they decided to move south. Confusing to me, <laughs> and I'm still trying to figure out uh, how that happened and why that happened. But it happened, my mother has family in Charleston, so I think she, had, she was missing home. Uh, happy wife, happy life, you know. So they moved to, uh, Georgia, first making Georgia where my, brother, where my brother was born, um, and then to uh, Somerville, South Carolina, where, of course, I was born. Went to all the public schools in Dorchester County. About high school was, be was when I began to realize that I had somewhat of a passion for writing. Uh, I never really thought writing was cool until I took an African-American literature course where the instructor of the course began to teach us from an educational perspective 
how the lyrics that Tupac Shakur had in his music was more than just, you know, junk, <laughs> as many of, you know, of the older folks in our community would say, but, you know, was an art, uh, and how he had a gift, and I found that to be, you know, quite inspirational, so I began to, you know, write poetry and began to experiment with writing. It wasn't until college where I actually decided to pursue it as a career, and of course, the most well, the only way it made sense for me to make a career out of writing was to go to the local newspaper where a friend of mine invited me to join. It was a multicultural newspaper known as the Roddy McMillan Record at Winthrop University. So at the same time I began writing for the local newspaper in college, I was also, uh, you know, kind of dealing with, I guess, a midlife crisis as much as a college student can, can be <laughs> experiencing a midlife crisis. Uh, you know, my grades were just, you know, not that good. I wasn't taking it very seriously, uh, probably having a little more fun than I should have been having uh, those first couple of years. So, of course, I was trying to, you know, figure out and, and, and navigate just a personal journey of what I can do in terms of living a life that would lead to some meaning and purpose. All my life, I had gone to church. My father was an AME pastor. My mother was an AME, so I had been in church forever. And I had heard all, you know, those years, uh, the scripture, I believe it's in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So I felt at that time, well, gosh, the reason I'm so miserable probably is because I'm not putting Christ first <laughs> in my life. So I began to try to make a conscious effort uh, to do that and take my faith a little more seriously. So I, you know, began praying more, reading my Bible more, uh, got involved in the local campus ministries at Winthrop University, uh, one being the gospel choir, which I had no business joining because I cannot sing a lick, but it gave me an opportunity to host uh, campus Bible studies that were connected with the, uh, with the uh, gospel choir. So while one of my friends, she allowed us to use her uh, room um, off campus to host these uh, Bible studies for young students who were, you know, kind of going through the same thing. I mean, struggling with being a Christian and what does that mean to be a young person and have fun, but also live a authentically Christian a lifestyle, makes, lifestyle and make sense of all of that. So she'd be, you know, in there, you know, cooking grits and frying fish and chicken while we were reading Timothy. Um, so that was always fun. Graduated college, came back home, started working at the Somerville Journal scene, which was fun, of course, that's my hometown a newspaper. And as I was working at the newspaper, I was attending church uh, at Morris Brown Amy Church, which is my home church. And the pastor there, of course, you know, I don't know how it is in the Episcopal Church, but in the Amy Church, I mean, they're always, I mean, looking for young people who even look like <laughs> they could uh, enter the ministry. So a pastor, he comes to me after one service and he says, so what are you waiting on? So of course, I had already been kind of, you know, contemplating uh, ministry, not seriously, but just thinking about if there was somewhere within the church that I could, you know, use my gifts of writing and communication. And when he said that, I guess I kind of took the hint. So I said, okay, well, maybe... Um, you know, this is something I need to think about and pray on. Um, and if, you know, ordained ministry is a path I want to choose. Of course, being a preacher's kid, everybody has, arrest, everybody has already chosen your destiny for you. So they tell you, oh, you're going, to, uh, you're going to preach, you're going to be a minister. But I wanted, of course, that to be a decision where I would make for myself. So in 2016, uh, I decided to uh, pursue ordained ministry while working in uh, journalism. And in 2018, I was assigned my first church, Wesley Amy Church, which is in Shuleville, which is in Jamestown. And both of those, you may, I mean, the total population of those two areas is like two people. Um, at the same time I was assigned Wesley Amy Church, was the same time I started pastoring, um, at, uh, not pastoring, I started working at the Post and Courier. So that was a challenging time because I literally, you know, started 
two new jobs at the same time and we was trying to figure them both out, I would never advise that anybody um, do that. It was a very difficult time um, in my life, but it was also very exciting. The role at the newspaper was advertised as a religion and Metro Beat reporter. When I got to the paper, Mitch Pugh, who was the executive editor at the time, said to me, you know, we're, we're so glad you're here because we have never had a dedicated religion beat reporter. I'm like, what? In the city of Charleston, the holy city where there are houses of worship on every single block, there has not been a dedicated beat reporter. And up until this time, I had been reading, I mean, all of these stories that Jennifer Bay Hawes was writing, Adam Parker was writing, Lauren Saucer was writing about all of these faith-based stories. I'm like, what do you mean you know, there hasn't been a dedicated religion be reported? Well, what they had been doing was rotating, uh, rotating the religion beat amongst reporters. So you had a handful of reporters who each were responsible uh, for writing a story for the faith and value section uh, a week. When I got to the paper, uh, that became my responsibility. I was excited about it because I felt that as, well, I felt that I could bring a unique perspective, I guess, to the newsroom. Uh, I was young, I was from the Charleston area, uh, I was African American, and there just weren't a lot of, well, I don't think there were any young African Americans from Charleston who were working in the newsroom at the time. Uh, so I felt that that was an opportunity for me to bring a unique perspective, and I was a pastor. So I also had the perspective of, you know, no, well, I'll put it this way. As a pastor who was also young, I felt that it was a chance to somewhat write stories that maybe not countered the narrative, but somewhat challenged the narrative that we read about every day, which is that every single young person on the entire planet is leaving <laughs> all of the mainline denominations. Uh, I mean, the, and of course I had read all, the, not all, but had been reading the Pew reports and all these other reports that just showed uh, the decline of youth membership in the church. And I, I don't know, I guess I was one of the few who kind of, one of the few young persons who had decided to stay uh, and be involved. And, and, and I knew that there were others uh, like me, and I felt that there was an opportunity um, as a religion be reported to, uh, to somewhat highlight that perspective. I also felt that journalism could make me an even better pastor as well, because I was able, I think, to transfer the skills that I owned in journalism into ministry. So being a good listener, I mean, you need that in journalism and pastoring. Uh, being empathetic uh, in both journalism and pastoring, I mean, you're talking with individuals in many cases at some of the most difficult moments in their lives. So that was a skill I think I was able to, uh, to transfer. And plus, journalism just gave me stories for sermons. <laughs> and that was, I mean, I think every week I, preached, I probably referenced uh, some sort of, of story, you know, that I had been working on to make a particular point uh, in a sermon. And it helped me to kind of get outside of what some would call, like, you know, your church bubble. I, I think for me, it was good to be working in journalism because it helped me stay engaged in the community, helped me stay informed um, in what was going on, and even really to know uh, what to preach about uh, on Sunday mornings. So, like, we had always been taught in the AME Church, um, in the Board of Examiners, which is like the in-house, uh, you know, system for training and educating that you should keep, you know, the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Um, and I find it, I kind of felt like I uh, embodied that quite literally. So, that was, a, that was a really good opportunity. I think the difficult part for me, especially early on in my uh, career in journalism, was striking a balance 
and making sure that I didn't, you know, allow, which is really not the challenges for me, but probably every journalist, but not allowing my, you know, personal beliefs to negatively like impact my reporting. So I'm the religion reporter, but I'm also a pastor. So, I mean, I mean, I have personal beliefs and affiliations, but I'm actually part of, you know, the system, part of the church. But my job as a religion reporter is to not just write about churches. It's not just to write about the Christian community. It's to write about all walks of life and faith in the Charleston area. So I knew that I had to be intentional about that. And I, you know, I really tried. I really tried to be intentional about engaging with members of the Jewish community, uh, with members of the Islamic uh, community, uh, and even uh, members of the agnostic and atheist community as well. And what I actually found was that the more I wrote stories uh, about the Jewish faith and the Islamic faith, it actually like strengthened my faith, and it actually made me a little, you know, well, not a little, made me a lot more tolerant. Not to say that I wasn't tolerant before, because both my parents were social workers, so I think that I've always kind of had that uh, perspective and appreciation for people of different backgrounds. But, but, but it did strengthen my faith, and I think it helped me become, you know, less dogmatic. And I kind of began to focus on the threads through the different faith traditions uh, that make sense, like loving your neighbor, you know, as you love yourself. I mean, that's something that we find in, in, in most, if not all, of the uh, faith traditions. So that really uh, strengthened my faith, especially at a time where I think my faith was being tested um, and challenged. So I went, as far as training and education goes, uh, Allen University, which is the uh, AME-funded school in Columbia, had a seminary uh, from the early to the mid-1900s uh, that became inactive for whatever reason. Bishop Green, who was the bishop now, came and revitalized the seminary, and I attended it for you know, four and a half years and then graduated uh, this past spring. So I remember uh, taking a uh, you know, church history course, and of course, like the first thing the instructor tells us is the difference, if it were, between, you know, the Christ of faith and historical Jesus and how the historical Jesus is a Jesus of, you know, liberation and, and a Jesus of the oppressed and the Christ of faith is, you know, someone who was co-opted, you know, by the church to present a particular image and, and all of that. So, you know, you're learning all these things like, <laughs> I mean, even as I was talking with, you know, pastors who had been, you know, to seminary who were actively pastoring would tell you things like, you know, well, even when you go to school, just make sure, you know, you leave that there. You know, don't bring your education <laughs> back to the church uh, because, you know, they try to take away your Jesus and all these kinds of things. Uh, and then I was talking with Tory Lifebridge and he said, yeah, well, that's why they call it seminary cemetery because this actually kills your faith as opposed to enhancing it. But, you know, so all of that was a challenge. So I'm trying to make sense um, of all of that. And I think for me, it was helpful as I was reporting to really uh, be engaged in other faith of traditions and to not be afraid to do that and not be afraid uh, to actually uh, be, you know, attracted, you know, to some of the tenets of the Muslim faith. So, so I, I thought it was just a kind of a unique uh, time of, of, I don't want to use the word deconstruction because that can sometimes be a complicated term, uh, but, but really in rebuilding parts of my faith um, and, and, and understanding fully why I believed what I believed. I do. Sure. So, um, Ricky, I have two questions that have first come to mind. Number one, I was always struck in all the conversations that you and I had when you worked for the paper at the breadth and depth and variety of the stories 
that you were writing on. Um, I mean, I talked to Ricky about um, how we might make sense of 9-11 as people of faith. Uh, I talked to Ricky about any number of issues pertaining to life in the Episcopal Church. The story that I still, um, you know, when you called me, I was like, what? You know, he, he called me and asked me about um, what I thought of gluten-free wafers and use of gluten-free wafers in church. He talked to me about, you know, pets and animals. I mean, it was, it was such a variety, and I, and I wondered how the choices get made of what stories that you would do. Were those your initiative, or did somebody in the newspaper say, hey, I've heard about this, why don't you cover that? And then um, a second question, based on what you've been saying uh, and I've certainly heard what you've, um, you know, what you were saying about going to seminary. I, I certainly have uh, had the same experience of the way that seminary can challenge you um, in the faith you bring to it when it sort of opens everything up. I wonder, uh, you've talked about how uh, being a journalist helped you to grow. I wonder if there have been moments when you felt challenged in your faith through some of the stories that you've ended up doing. Yeah. So to your, to your first, yeah, so that first story, I, that might have been the first religion story I wrote, the gluten-free one. What, what's so funny is that one got picked up. So, and that was like, that's probably the most widely read story. <laughs> so that, that's how they baited me in. It's like, I was thinking, oh my God, every story I write is gonna end up on the Today Show. Um, when it was like, no, that was like literally the only one that went viral that I ever wrote. Um, God, I, I, so I, I don't quite remember. I, my guess is that because that was, I think, my first or one of my first stories, I do believe the features editor probably sent something related to that story to me. Um, and I was reading that today and I was kind of like, well, why did I even... How did that even become a thing? Because I guess the only, I mean, the only folks who might um, be against that or who wouldn't use gluten-free would be the Catholic Church, maybe. I mean, it doesn't seem as problematic in other, um, in, in other areas. So I kind of said, well, I wonder why I even reached out to <laughs> Reverend Shoemaker for that, for that story in the first place. But, um, you know, but it worked out because it uh, ended up getting widely read. So, yeah. That's a great question. Maybe it's because of the reporter. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it could have been. It could have been the top of it. Could have, they could have been like, well, what the heck is this? This makes this makes absolutely no sense. Uh, so yeah. So so a lot of the stories, yeah, were would either be you know assigned to me by editors. I mean, I think most of them, especially those first few years, were. were as I, um, the longer I stayed, so yes, yeah, so, so, some stories are assigned by editors. Some stories kind of assign themselves. Like I said, I wrote, you know, so that story, for instance, would have been in the faith and value section. So I would write what would be considered a more of a feature faith story, you know, a week. That wouldn't necessarily be what folks call hard news. So like when the, when the Catholic diocese on a Friday afternoon, nonetheless, released all of the names of the priests in the diocese who had been credibly accused of sexual assault. You know that would be a, that that ran that day, right? Like that, we we we're not going to wait till the next Sunday for the faith and value section to write that story because it's a pressing story. Um, when St. Andrews, you know, caught fire, that story ran that day. That's a religion story that has a hard news peg, but you know, others like you know, stories that we would write or that I would write about, you know, like the church's, you know, 100 plus anniversary or, uh, you know, the wave of uh, predominantly black churches um, that had been leaving the peninsula because of gentrification, which is something you and I have talked about and you are deeply researching. Um, you know, those are, you know, more featurey pieces, uh, you know, that could probably wait to the faith and value section and not, um, you know, wouldn't be ran that that day. But the longer I stayed, I think for me, at least I would like to believe I had some bit of leverage. Uh, and I began choosing the stories I wrote. And a lot of the stories uh, I wrote about 
were shaped by my interests uh, in the intersection of race and religion. One of the first uh, stories uh, I wrote that was faith-based when I got to the paper uh, was about uh, First Baptist uh, Church where uh, Marshall Blaylock pastors. Uh, and I can't remember why. I think there may have been an anniversary or something uh, coming up. But, you know, they kind of had... Well, I, actually, I know what it was. They were installing a plaque on the outside of the church that was near the stairwell where the church says the enslaved members, well, I guess they wouldn't have been members, but uh, the enslaved guests at the church would sit. So their way of acknowledging them was to, you know, put a plaque as, you know, recognition. In reporting that story, what I learned was that Marsh Street Baptist, uh, which is on uh, Marsh Street in downtown Charleston, came out of First Baptist. So after the Civil War, um, according to Reverend Blaylock uh, and uh, Reverend Griffin, who was uh, no longer in the Charleston area, the enslaved members, of course, left First Baptist after the Civil War and started their own congregation. Um, and now, you know, post uh, Trump and, you know, in this era of uh, United States American history, um, there's this, you know, unique relationship between two congregations and, you know, they're trying to foster um, racial reconciliation and, and all of those things. So I thought that that was just an incredible story um, and an incredible history because it's, you know, it's religious history, but it's also Charleston's history. Um, and then, you know, I mean, in Charleston, I mean, race and religion almost always kind of intersect and I thought that was interesting, so I began to really, you know, seek opportunities um, to where I could steal Adam Parker's beat <laughs> as the race reporter uh, and merge it with my beat as the, um, as the religion reporter. And, and, and once, you know, as, as the scripture said, you seek, you'll find. So as I was looking for those things, they, they, they kind of began to come. So... Again, it was always important uh, for me to, you know, recognize, okay, you know, you can't, that can't be every religion story, you know, it has to be uh, some other things. So I always tried to, you know, make sure that that wasn't the only topic as it relates to faith that I was, uh, that I was writing about. And I, you know, I, I think um, I did that somewhat uh, justice, I guess. So I hope that um, answers your question. But... Oh yeah, We've, so how, what was your, tell me the question. It was, it was how has covering the religion beat for the paper, if at all, how did that challenge your identity as a pastor and as a, a Christian? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so I think, again, like I, the more I, you know, interacted with, other faith communities, I think, you know, the first thing it challenged probably was my belief in, like, hell, <laughs> and this idea, my belief in hell, the existence of hell, yeah, I know that, that I don't, you know, I might get in trouble for talking about this, but, yeah, I mean, I, I think I, and I don't even know where that came from, I might have just been in conversation with other, you know, pastors who, uh, who also didn't fully accept that notion, but, you know, the idea, you know, that someone, or at least as I have been taught in the church, that someone who is of another faith tradition, um, who doesn't subscribe to the Christian tradition, is somehow, you know, damned to, like, eternal suffering and fire was something I began to struggle with. Um, I don't know. It just seemed like it was a difficult thing to, um, to, wrap, my, to wrap my head around. So... Um, you know, so, so, so there was that. Um, I'm sure there are other, you know, uh, tenets of my, of my faith that I wrestle with that I probably am, um, that I am forgetting. I mean, I, I became really attracted to the, um, to the Islamic faith. And I think it's because as I learned about Islamic, the Islamic history in Charleston, that many, you know, of the Africans who had come, um, well, they didn't come, they were brought to, uh, to America, particularly to the Charleston area, um, were Muslim. 
So, you know, I have friends who, you know, who are not, who don't subscribe to the Christian tradition, um, who constantly, you know, berate Christianity as just, you know, something that's the white man's religion and that sort of thing, something that was imposed upon uh, the enslaved Africans and that sort of thing. And um, again, I mean, this, especially during the, you know, post-Trump stuff, man, it was really, it was really, um, you know, difficult wrestling with, with, with all of that. So, uh, I don't know. So I think that I just had to free myself to be willing to listen to stories from all faith traditions and not be afraid uh, to find different walks attractive. Um, and now I'm pretty pretty comfortable in the. Oh yeah, you know what? No, I I never I don't I don't think I ever had um had that come up if they if they took took issue with it they never said it. Um, yeah, I mean, but but yeah, no, that's a uh, that's a good question. I don't I don't remember ever receiving any uh, any pushback. Um, so that was it. What 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 I always was wrestled with was in like pastoring because I was a reporter you know I had I, I wrestled with like sharing you know my personal political views like in the pulpit um, because I was like you know what I don't want my editor or somebody to <laughs> hear this um, and then it, you know it compromised so yeah it, it, sometimes it was, it was very um, you know difficult because I always kind of felt like I had to be um, you know, very, very cautious and, and cagey in, in what I say because I feel like I was always speaking publicly, whether it was in the newspaper or um, or in the pulpit. So, so yeah, but I, you know, I don't, I don't remember ever receiving any any pushback from members of my church for any of the any of the stories I wrote. Um, yeah. Gosh, you kind of I got lost. I think I was going to talk about how stories are decided. So, uh, so yes. Yeah, so um, I th you had mentioned before um, even the uh, the Episcopal diocese split, which was a grand time at the newspaper. Um, yeah, yeah. So you know, it was it was it was tough. I mean, when I had got there, they had kind of not been uh, covering it. Uh, because, you know, I guess they would constantly get berated with phone calls from folks who were just never happy uh, with the newspaper's coverage. And plus, it was just an extremely complicated issue for a new young reporter to even wrap my head around. I mean, I was terrified to even cover it because I just knew I was going to mess something up and I knew I was going to get something wrong. I'm sorry. So the the... The, yes, so the split of the Episcopal Church. I was terrified. I'm still terrified. So, I, and yeah, exactly. So I was, I was nervous because I, I knew I was going to get, you know, something wrong in, you know, you know factually or, or, or not really representing both sides in the, in the proper way. Uh, I don't even remember what, I'm sure the first story I did um, related to the split may have been an update, you know, on one of the uh, on one of the court cases or something. But yeah, that was that was difficult. So when to your point, when Bishop Ruth uh, was elected, and I think this kind of goes back into how stories are um, decided and covered. So I think she was elected on what, like a Saturday? Well, she was consecrated on a Saturday. Okay. On that Sunday, there was no yeah. you know, mention of Post Courier yeah. of her consecration. The following weekend, right. you did an interview with her. Yeah. But that immediate to us, that yeah, was like, yeah. this was an enormous deal. And it is an enormous yeah. deal. So, and I don't know how that fell through. Now, I, I'll tell you this I mean, I was a religion reporter and the Metro reporter. So, what that could have been, well, it, like, and I didn't work on Saturdays. So, 
Now, I mean, in, in retrospect, what should have happened was me just knowing that this, um, or I guess I don't, how I would have known, I mean, maybe I, there was, would have been some way to have known, but knowing that this uh, was coming up and it's an historic event and just set, you know, my hours aside, <laughs> you know, to be able to write uh, the story on a Saturday so that it gets that immediate coverage, because again, that's not a feature story, that's, that's sort of a breaking, more newsier uh, story. So that absolutely should have been, and I think, then it looked worse because of course all the TV stations um, did and that we were kind of left out. But Don't get me to do it. Yeah, don't don't get me to do it. Don't get me to do it. But yeah, I mean, theoretically, yeah, I mean, but see, but the, the challenging thing is, is I didn't like. I mean, up until and at that point, I don't even think I had a re religion editor. Like, I think the only editor I had was a was the news editor for my North Charleston coverage. But at at that point, huh? Yeah. It wasn't a priority. I mean, and just like, again, like, like me, when I got to the paper, it, di it didn't seem like the religion be, and it, I don't even think that's really a post and current. I think that's n newspapers, like the re religion as a beat is just not always a, a priority, which for me it should be, because again, if, and if nowhere else <laughs> in America, certainly in Charleston, I, I think that it, um, I think that it should have been. So, uh, so yeah, so you know, again, I don't want to, I don't want to blame folks uh, who um, live up the street from me because actually a couple of my editors live <laughs> nearby. But yeah, I mean, it, it should have been um, a priority, and it wasn't. So what, what usually would have been again my my practice for uh, you know coming into the newsroom on a, on a Monday, especially for faith stories, is if would be to do something like that, would be to write like a broader, more enterprise kind of story that is not just, okay, this happened, but, but to share this happened, but also have, you know, in, in interviewing quotes from Bishop uh, Ruth that kind of reflects on, you know, the meaning of the moment and even plans, you know, for, for the diocese. And I really got the opportunity, I think maybe a month or so later, when, and then I was able to sit down with her um, and, you know, go to the office and do kind of a larger, piece on her, um, you know, her thoughts, particularly about racial uh, reconciliation. So, so, so yeah, that was just a missed opportunity, uh, to, to, to be quite honest with you. Um, yeah. I have editor, you know, was very clear. I mean, his position was, you know, I care about the things you care about. So whatever you feel is a story. And again, I mean, this was, you know, I, I had been there, you know, a little after two years. So I think by that time, you know, we had a good enough relationship and he trusted me enough to just say, you know, if you f feel like something is a story and you want to pursue it, you know, nine times out of 10, I'll, I'll support that. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, he kind of gave me free range really to 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 choose um and, and never really 
uh, pushed me in a particular direction. Um, now, I've had problems with the editorials, for sure, I mean, uh, but, you know, and, and that was always, you know, a, a, a challenge. Like, I think the classic example I always think about was the Calhoun um, editorial. I mean, they, I mean, the newspaper, uh, I think their position was to, when the city was trying to demolish it, was to keep it up and then add, you know, but add a plaque that provides context. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. That can go in the museum. Um, you know, statues are built more so to honor people, but not so much to provide history lessons. But that was my, you know, that was my personal um, opinion. Um, and I even had, you know, not all, I mean, a lot of my friends don't read the newspaper, but a couple of my family members did. And I mean, they were just angry about, you know, the editorial. And it was always a challenge trying to explain to people, you know, that the editorial department and the news department was separate. And that's, I think, because I don't, I don't really know if the newspaper always does a good job at explaining that as well. So sometimes it's not, you know, clear that, that a commentary or something is, um, you know, is an opinion um, and instead of a, an actual news story. I think they did eventually, in, like if you go online, and I think it's in the paper as well, I don't so much read the physical paper, I'm always reading online, but like there's a blurb I think under in the editorial section that, you know, that says, you know, these are, you know, opinions. Uh, this is the uh, opinion of the you know, institution or, or something. Like these aren't supposed to be unbiased news articles, but these are what the editorial board um, is writing as an opinion. But again, I mean, people, you know, still called and are angry about editorials thinking that it's um, news stories because the, they're not always uh, seen as something that's separate. And the press reporters in a difficult position, I'll tell you that, and an uncomfortable one. So, mm. Yeah, no, I, yeah, and I, I've I've heard that too. I mean, gosh, like I, when I got to the paper, I mean, every time I would talk to, to well, not I wouldn't say every time, but it was it was quite frequent that I would hear, especially from like, you know, the activist groups and like the social justice groups. Uh, they would say exactly what you're saying, like, oh man, you just don't know how terrible they were. And they would tell me by the time they would have to show up to the building and protest and hold press conferences because of you know, the newspaper's coverage. Uh, I covered the city of North Charleston, which at the time was 50% black. And the city of North Charleston has, you know, I mean, I think at one point in time, one of the highest, if not the highest, like crime rate or something, um, in the nation, so there was always, you know, for a long while, a perception of the city as being, you know, poor, crime-ridden, uh, you know, and majority minority, and many people in the community felt that that image was reflected in the newspaper and perpetuated in, in the Post and Courier, uh, and I think that, you know, they it, it took, I mean, I think they've gotten beyond it now, uh, but you know, as um, you know, as a reporter coming to cover the city, I think that that was something I was cognizant of and always, you know, heard from it, someone anytime I talked to them, um, not any time, but heard a lot from sources in the city of North Charleston. But it has gotten better. Uh, and I think part of that has to do with, 
you know, being intentional about having a more diverse newsroom, um, not just reporters, but, you know, decision makers, editors, um, and even on the op-ed team. So uh, I think that's something, I know that's something they've been working on. I mean, they, uh, Autumn Phillips, who was the manager editor, when I got there was, was very intentional about that and created a committee that was focused on that and she was intentional about going to the HBCUs and trying to recruit a more diverse pool of, of candidates. But I think that's something that could have helped um, or maybe has helped to change uh, what, you're, to what you're talking about. Yes, sir. I mean, as far as considering it, I, th I think folks are considering it. I mean, it's c it came up, I think it m that might have come up in the team assembly that we, that we had. I mean, so affordable housing is a campaign that Just Ministry has been uh, focused on and that's mainly been advocating for an affordable housing trust fund. Perhaps advocating for rent control could be tacked onto that. But s uh, is that legal in South Carolina? Do we know that it's legal? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. It is.
covering cage I mean, my first exposure to cage i think was through the racial bias audit um and covering the city of north charleston and seeing them i mean for years you know try to push mayor sumney and the council to have a racial bias audit done at the police department and for a while to no avail um it was interesting to me because I'm just like, you know, why don't these socials like give up? Um, but they kept pushing and eventually, you know, the city, the city agreed to do it. Of course, this was like you know, during the 2020 protests and, and all of that. And I, you know, explained just kind of my own faith formation that was happening. So, you know, you know, equity and, and justice and race and all that became very, interesting to me and as far as I could see Cajun was really the only well I shouldn't say it was the only organization but certainly the the largest the largest organization the most visible organization advocating for justice in a place like Charleston which like what the heck you know so I mean that was extremely attractive to me at the same time by about my fourth year at the paper, and it could have been a confluence of, of things. Again, like I guess I was in school and I was also pastoring. So, I mean, the daily grind and of news really became tiring and exhausting as well. And I think that I was trying to also find something I thought would balance a well with my you know, career, as a pastor that, you know, wouldn't um, be as exhausting as journalism had, um, you know, had been, but also was something I was passionate about. And I really felt that I could be more effective in that movement by being a part um, of Cajun more so than I had been, um, you know, on the outside just writing about it um, as opposed to being um, a part of a group that was actually advocating for the change. So, and then the position opened up. <laughs> so it was like, oh God, well, this kind of seems like um, the right opportunity and, and, and the right time. So, uh, so yeah, so it's been fun. I mean, I, gosh, I feel like every day, you know, with Cajun is, uh, is like day one because I'm, you know, constantly having to, spent a lot of time learning uh, about all of these you know, different campaigns and issues. Uh, but I've considered myself a lifelong learner, so I'm enjoying it. And I'm happy to be part of a you know, group that has really made some, some monumental change in, in Charleston where it's very much needed, so. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Good time. I, I will say uh, Ricky is the first person um, that I can recall uh, who works for the Justice Ministry, who is also a pastor. Uh, and uh, Pastor Benton, my co-president, we were talking that um, I do think that that is a great value to the Justice Ministry, just as I'm sure it was a value uh, to bring that perspective to your work uh, as a journalist, um, because Cajun organizes through faith communities. And so to have somebody on the staff who can bring that perspective um, I, I think is hugely, hugely important and a great gift. So um, it was the newspaper's loss, but the Justice Ministry's uh, gain. Um, I hope that, um, I know uh, we have a reception, uh, that, and there's plenty of food, I think, so uh, ho hopefully um, you could come over and, um, and enjoy uh, some of that, and hopefully you could stay just a little bit for some further conversation. Next month, as I announced today, and we just confirmed this today, um, our longtime deacon, Greg Smith, has sadly made the decision to retire. He has been uh, ordained for nearly 25 years, all of which have been within this diocese. And so Deacon Greg's ministry uh, <laughs> has encompassed a very active time in the Episcopal Church when he was going through the ordination process. This was pre-schism. So his ministry, I think, offers a very interesting perspective on where we've come in the Episcopal Church. And so uh, for this lecture time next month, um, I'm going to have a conversation with Deacon Greg 
um, to uh, have him reflect on his ministry uh, within our diocese. So mark your calendars for that November the 12th at 5 p.m. Again, thank you so very much, uh, Ricky. Thank you, and thank you for anybody who's been watching online.